Hey everyone, this is Anshul Sadaria, software engineer 3 at Google. I usually get a lot of messages on my social media handles like, Hey, can you tell me how I can prepare for product based companies in 6 months? Or they are like, Can you share some important technical concepts which will help me clear the technical interviews? So first of all, there is no shortcut to success. But in this video, I am going to take you through my choice of 15 important concepts which can help you prepare better for technical interviews. An important note over here, these are not the only concepts which you can expect in a technical interview. But if you are not preparing at least these concepts, you can say goodbye to your dreams of clearing the technical interview. But before we dive deep into the video, Make sure you check out Scaler's free masterclasses taken by industry leading experts only on Scaler's event page. Link is in the description below. Data structures and algorithms. Now I know a lot of you would be asking me, hey, we know data structures and algorithms, but what specifically into that? Don't worry, I'm going to share some of the most important data structures and algorithms which you must prepare for technical interviews. Starting with recursion and backtracking. Okay, so recursion is used to solve those flavor of problems wherein the main problem can be broken down into optimal sub problems. Now the solution to those sub problems can be used to create the solution for the larger problem. In this particular flavor, you keep on calling the same function again and again to solve the optimal sub problems. Now moving on to the backtracking algorithm. Okay, this forms the basis of lot of search exploration problems. One of the most trivial backtracking algorithm that we all must have used at some time in our life is going to be depth first search. You know, backtracking is used to solve those flavor of problems where we embark on a path exploration. We try to walk upon a path, we realize it's not the right path. So we take a step back and try to explore other paths possible at that particular junction. So make sure you try out as many problems as possible which fall into the category of recursion and backtracking so that you are comfortable during your technical interviews. Now the second most important data structure and algorithm is going to be dynamic programming. I know a lot of you would be scared on hearing dynamic programming because I usually get scared. But don't worry, like dynamic programming is similar to recursion. The only difference here is that we try to exploit the overlapping sub problem structure of the original problem. So here also we try to identify those overlapping sub problems, try to solve them and the solution to those sub problems create the solution for the larger one. But make sure while you are practicing dynamic programming, you understand the concepts of memoization, tabularization, different methods of bottom up and top down while solving dynamic programming problems. Now moving on to the third important topic, obviously the search algorithms. When I say search algorithms, the first thing that would come to your mind is binary search. That's true, binary search is really important. But I'm not asking you to understand binary search as a standalone problem or a standalone topic. Binary search forms an important basis for a lot of larger problems. So try to identify where you can use binary search in order to optimize your solutions. Also, you must be aware that binary search can only be applied on sorted search spaces. Sometimes the search spaces are explicitly provided to us, but in certain cases, the explicit structure may not be possible. So sometimes there is an implicit sorted structure which can also be leveraged to perform binary search on top of it. Some of the most famous problems in this particular direction are book allocation, painter's problem and so on. So make sure you identify whether the search space is sorted or unsorted. Even without that, we can perform binary search on top of it. Now moving on to the next set of data structure and algorithm, sorting algorithms. We all know there are so many important sorting algorithms having O of n square time complexity like bubble sort, insertion sort, selection sort. We move to more efficient sorting algorithms like merge sort, quick sort having O of n log n time complexity. Now you must also be aware there are some sorting algorithms of O of n time complexity. These are bucket sort, radix sort. Now it's really important to understand in which situation what sorting algorithm is more efficient. In some cases the condition is optimal for you to use radix sort or bucket sort. Also remember in technical interviews no one is going to ask you hey implement merge sort or quick sort. This is usually going to be part of some sort of pre-computation in the larger problem. 
So make sure you identify whether the sorting structure is mandatory for your problem or not. And based on that, you can perform this pre-computation. Now moving on to my personal favorite, graph theory. We all know graph theory has so many real world applications. We all use social media applications on our day to day basis. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn and so on. All of these are built on top of graph theory. So make sure you are fluent with some of the important concepts like graph traversals, shorting, shortest path algorithm, spanning tree, cycles, topological sorting and whatnot. You know, also remember that similar to binary search or sorting algorithms, sometimes the structure is not explicitly provided to be of the graph theory. So you might need to deduce the original input space so that you can leverage the graph theory concepts in order to solve them. And lastly, an important data structure and algorithm, hashing. You should have a decent understanding of what all different type of hash functions are there. And you should also have an awareness of when to use what hash function. You should also have an understanding of what all are the different real world applications of hashing, like cryptography, distributed systems, and so on. You should also know what all different types of collision resolution techniques are there. For example, linear chaining, bucketing, and so on. So you should be fluent with all those topics in order to become great at hashing concept. Now we have known some of the most important data structures and algorithms, but one underrated topic which is very important in technical interviews is time and space complexity analysis. Now you come up with a solution, you try to code it, and the solution is perfect as well. But as an interviewer, I would want to know how you reached the solution and why you had a particular choice of data structure and algorithm. So make sure you do the proper time and space complexity analysis, discuss those complexities with your interviewer, and then explain why you had a rationale behind choosing one data structure and algorithm and not the other one. So if I want to give you an example, in an interview, I had a choice of depth first search and breadth first search. Both of them were the correct solutions. But upon analyzing them through time and space complexity, I realized that the best case time complexity for depth first search was much lower than breadth first search. And that's the reason which I gave to the interviewer as well. And it definitely helped me earn some brownie points. Now, moving on to an important topic outside data structures and algorithms is object oriented programming. Now, this is a very important technical paradigm in the tech industry right now, and it's going to remain for a very long time. So you should definitely try to understand what all different concepts are there related to object oriented programming or more popularly known as OOPS. Inheritance, polymorphism, overloading, overriding and whatnot. These are some of the most important concepts when I talk about OOPS. Also, if I want to give you an example, like during one of my interviews, I was asked the question related to a car manufacturing company. I had to create a low level system design for the same. So what I did was I created a parent class for vehicles and then spawn some child classes related bikes, cars, trucks, and so on. So you can try to leverage this object oriented programming paradigm and try to frame your solution based upon that. But if you don't know what those concepts are, you will never be able to come up with the correct solution. Also, some of the niche concepts like constructors and destructors, which I usually ignored in my college time, they are also really, really important. So make sure you cover object oriented programming as much in detail as possible. Now you must be wondering when I talked about low level system design, let's try to cover them as well. Let's first begin with high level system design and what it encompasses. So high level system design, think of it in a way that you are trying to manufacture a car. Okay, so there are bigger chunks like exhaust system, then there is combustion engine, then there is battery unit and so on. The, these are some of the larger chunks and they interact with each other in some way. So you try to identify how they interact with each other without carrying into detail how the battery unit works or how the combustion engine works in detail. If I want to give you an example in terms of software engineering, let's say I covered one video earlier related to Tinder or Twitter's system design. You know, so there are different microservices involved in them as well. We don't worry a lot about how this microservices work in detail inside the code level, but we want to understand as a larger system, how this microservices interact with each other and what is the flow of information from one system to the other system. Now moving on to an important part, low level system design. Carrying forward the same example of the car manufacturing, we talked about battery unit, combustion engine and whatnot. 
right now in the low level system design we want to focus on the integrities of what goes inside the battery unit what goes inside the combustion engine and so on we covered in the high level design of how these systems interact with each other but here we want to focus on what happens inside those microsystems okay so taking on to the example of software engineering we want to understand what all different classes this service might have how we are going to create objects from that how is the information con contained inside those objects and how will this information transmitted from one algorithm to the other algorithm and so on database concepts now we all know that databases form the main pillar for almost every real life application that we use nowadays when we talk about database concepts make sure you understand relational and non relational databases to the core when i talk about relational databases those are the sql databases for the non relational ones those are the no sql databases make sure you understand the difference between both of them and when one database should be preferred over the other you can expect some theoretical questions related to that and also some system design rounds can include questions related to it for example let's say if the write qps is a lot higher then in such situation you might use some no sql database like cassandra or something of your own choice you know but we must be aware in what situation what database is more preferable going more into the theoretical aspects of relational databases some of the important topics or concepts are indexing databases you must be well versed with the sql programming language you must also know different types of joins that are performed on the table along with the acidic properties of the relational databases so you should be well versed about the theoretical aspect as well as the practical implications of choosing one database over the other operating system concepts i know this is a very niche topic but it is also a widely asked one during technical interviews because it has real world applications in both computer hardware as well as software resource allocation now when i talk about operating system concepts two of the ones which come to the top of my mind starting with concurrency and multi threading you should be aware that the real world applications have immense concurrent usage so it will lead to race conditions now how you can mitigate with it you can use some synchronization methods using mutex semaphores and locks and what not so you should have an understanding of what all different synchronization methods are there on top of them it can lead to deadlocks as well so what all different deadlock detection algorithms are available in the market you should also have an understanding of what all different threading libraries are available for example i remember in one of my interviews i was asked the difference between mutex and semaphore and i had a very long argument with the panel of interviewers but i had the concept with clarity in my mind and i also demonstrated some examples of when one can be more useful than the other one along with that i also remember one coding assignment which was given to me where i had to use multi threading concepts and had to use so many threading libraries in order to prepare a concurrent system so make sure you have decent theoretical as well as practical understanding of concurrency synchronization deadlock detection and all those topics related to concurrency and multi threading now moving on to the other important concept related to operating systems memory management gain a basic understanding of what all difference is there between stack allocation as well as heap allocation you should also be aware about what all different pointers are available for example smart pointers is there if you are using c++ if not you are pretty much free related to the pointers now let me give you an example if you are coding in c++ you have two options vectors or list vectors are allocated memory in contiguous memory space whereas list are allocated memory in discontiguous chunks so it has different time and space complexity trade offs so you should be aware about all of these small small integrities which can be very important in a technical interview along with that for example you are declaring something as a global variable or you are declaring something as a local variable so if you are declaring in the global space it is going to occupy space in the heap allocation if you are passing it as a function parameter then it is more likely going to obviously is going to occupy the stack memory allocation along with that you should also have a decent code awareness related to what code is going to cause memory leaks and how you can utilize different garbage collection tactics in order to get rid of it networking networking concepts are really essential in order to understand how the data flows between the client side and the server side also within the server side how the data flows between different systems and microservices so make sure you get yourself acquainted with how the dns works 
what all is the difference between TCP IP protocol and the UDP protocol. For example, TCP guarantees the structure and ordering of the packets, whereas UDP doesn't guarantee that. So in what circumstances can we use one particular protocol over the other? If you must be familiar, usually in video streaming applications, UDP is preferred over TCP. But in some of the messaging applications, TCP is much more preferred over UDP. Also, you must be aware about different networking concepts related to IP addressing, routing, subnetting and so on. So make sure you get hands-on experience related to different security protocols as well as networking layers while you are preparing for your technical interviews. Now moving on to the last important concept which you should be very much familiar with when you are applying for technical interviews, it's testing and debugging. Yes, it is one of the most underrated concepts when it comes to the software development life cycle. Make sure you are aware about different testing techniques like unit testing, integration testing, manual testing, end-to-end -end testing and concepts like test-driven development. It will not just help you in your technical interviews in a theoretical perspective, but okay, let's talk about the practical implication of this. I usually tell candidates when they are giving their technical interviews to prepare some test cases before they jump onto the coding part. So when they dry run the test cases on the approach they have in their mind, they realize that okay, there is some gap in what I'm thinking and what the solution should be and then they try to improvise the solution. So without test cases, without proper testing, never jump onto the solution and the coding part. And that's the reason why it helped me a lot during my technical interviews. I was able to identify the gap between what solution I had in my mind and what the correct solution can be. Also lastly, make sure you have some hands-on experience related to some of the important debugging tools which are provided by the modern IDs like VS Code, IntelliJ or whatever ID you are using. This will help you a lot trying to reduce your time, identifying where the mistake can, can be and also improve your productivity overall as an engineer. So these were 15 most important concepts that you must prepare for your technical interviews. Now, if you found this content insightful, make sure you give this video a thumbs up, add your opinions in the comment section, share it with your friends, colleagues and everyone you want to if you know they are preparing for their technical interviews. Lastly, don't forget to subscribe to Scaler's YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the bell icon so that you never miss out on such amazing content. Thank you. Have a nice day.